What's in a proton? And love this animation, so I'll give credit where credit is due. Now the proton history. Ernest Rutherford and Niels Bohr published a model of the atom going back to 1913 where the atom had a positively charged nucleus and electrons in orbit. And in 1920, Rutherford then gave that positive charge the name the proton. But there are problems over the next decade. Isotopes of atoms were found, and they were found at integer multiples of hydrogen, which meant that there was something else in the nucleus that didn't have a positive charge like the proton and probably had roughly about the same mass. And so in 1932, the neutral neutron was discovered by James Chadwick. And this is what it looks like. Right? A proton and an electron is a hydrogen atom. But if you add another proton for two, you know, separated by neutrons, you have the helium atom. Three protons is lithium. And you keep adding protons until you get to you know, 118 and you form all of the known elements. And that's the periodic table of elements. But really, it wasn't as simple as just the proton being a particle that has a single positive charge. Um, it's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. And until you have all those pieces, you, know, you really don't understand the picture that you're building. So we're going to ask that question again. What's in a proton? And to answer that question, we have to go back through all the different experiments to understand the components. And it really is confusing. And it started to get confusing in 1968 when the proton was determined to be a composite particle, meaning that it is consisting of other particles. And it was determined then at that time that it consists of three quarks. And the neutron also consists of three quarks. But there's a difference in their type of quarks that you can see here. The important thing to note is that a quark has never been found in isolation. right? It's only when you see protons or neutrons or other what's called hadrons. But in 2015, CERN reported experiments of proton collisions now showing five quarks. Right? It's called a pentaquark. Important thing here to remember uh, for the upcoming slides is in these energy experiments, and there has to be high energy exper uh, experiments, four quarks and one antiquark, that's antimatter, antimatter, are found. Oh, but wait, all right? How can a proton really be made of quarks? Because decay results and other experiments show very different particles that are being um, released. So in beta plus decay, you see the before on the left and the after on the right. So what starts off as a proton can become a neutron. A proton can become a neutron, but along the way, it ejects a positron and a neutrino. Right? Where did those come from if the proton is made of quarks? And beta minus decay is, is just the opposite. Right? It's a neutron that can become a proton. But here's more particles. An electron and an antineutrino come out of a neutron. <laughs> Why? And even more observations. A proton can become a neutron through what's called an electron capture process. So when an electron is in orbit, right, around the nucleus, it can be absorbed by the proton and become a neutron, occasionally. And more experiments, near the nucleus of a uh, atom, uh, two particles can be created out of nothing, called the pair production process, right, a photon hits and the results are two particles, a positron and electron. Where did those come from? And one more, why does an electron orbit a proton? Like you see on the left, that's an atom. But when an electron meets a positron, they annihilate, poof, they're gone. And they have the exact same charge. The proton and positron are both plus one. Why? It, well, it certainly is a confusing puzzle, right? So let's review the pieces that we have so far, right? Because this is what we need to do to be able to put together the entire picture, right? 1968, a proton is three quarks. Oh, no, wait. 
At high energies now, it has five quarks. But we never see quarks. Instead, we see a proton ejects a positron. A proton absorbs an electron. A neutron ejects an electron. The you know, nucleus of an atom ejects a positron and an electron. Electrons circle protons, but they annihilate with positrons. Right? It's a confusing mess, but none of that do you ever see a quark. And, you know, if you thought you had to model the proton figured out before 2015, God bless you. But you know what? You didn't have the missing piece, which was discovered by CERN in 2015. And we need to rethink that entire puzzle to understand the proton. Because now it can be explained thanks to the pentaquark. Because the proton is a pentaquark. Right? That's what they found in high energy experiments. And in this model... A pentaquark would be made of four electrons and one positron. All the particles that you see in experiments, other than these collision experiments where you think you see a, a quark. A quark is really just a high energy electron or a high energy positron if it's an anti-quark. And if you're going, gosh, how could this happen? Uh, electron collision experiments do show that they produce quarks, and including more recently even a four quark, what's called a tetraquark, which would be these vertices of a uh, tetrahedron that you see there. But here's the model. Right? The, the four quarks of the tetrahedral uh, are, the, um, are very strong interactions, and that's what you call the strong force. Beyond it, it's repelling, but only on an axis. However, the positron in the middle is um, positively charged and what attracts an electron. That's the model of the pentaquark. All right, I'll explain it in a second with uh, matching all the experiments, but first the neutron. Now, a neutron would be a very similar structure, right? The four tetrahedral quarks, which are probably electrons. But you really have two different types because both of these would be neutral. Probably the more common one is going to be the one on the left that has an electron and a positron held together loosely in the middle. But a same neutral charge, and that would be neutral, by the way, because those two particles annihilate. They're essentially neutral when they're combined. But... Uh, it could also be an empty one as well. That would also be neutral. Now let's put this to the test. Right? Does this fit all the pieces of the puzzle? So first off, 1968, when quarks were first found and continue to be found in low-energy proton collision experiments, this is what happens. Particle accelerator would uh, hit a proton, and because it's a pentaquark with low energy, the positron and electron in there would annihilate. They're still there, they're just not detected. But three quarks would be detected. And these would be high energy electrons that would appear like quarks. Now finally, at higher energies, five quarks are found. And the reason is because at these high energies now, the remaining positron and electron would not annihilate. Now you can count four. And the four that you would count are the four quarks and the anti-quark that are found in experiments. Now let's put this to the decay test too. All right, this structure explains the results of beta minus decay. Remember, this is when a neutron becomes a proton. But imagine an event that has to occur, and it occurs at some probability, such as solar neutrinos, with sufficient kinetic energy, because that energy is required to dislodge something, and it dislodges the electron. And this is exactly what is seen in beta minus decay when a neutron becomes a proton and ejects those two particles. And it also explains the pair production process, right? Remember, this is a high-energy photon, a gamma ray, striking somewhere near the nucleus. It's probably hitting the neutron, and it ejects both of those particles. It has enough energy to eject both the positron and the electron. And the opposite of beta minus decay, that same process of uh, something with kinetic energy, such as a solar neutrino ejecting the positron, turns the proton into a neutron. Again, all of these match experiments and what is ejected from the particle. Electron capture would be very, very similar, but now you've got an electron that's in orbit. Something strikes it to give it enough force to overcome the repelling force, and of course it's attracted by the positron, and that turns the proton into the neutron, known as electron capture process. 
But that force, that force that was keeping that electron in place in the first place, is axial. It only occurs between two of the tetrahedral electrons. Now it's strong when it holds it together because they're within the standing wave of the proton, but it repels, and it repels at the cube of distance beyond there. That forces the electron out at the same time it's being attracted by the positron in the middle. And that creates an atom, but you remove those forces. And if it's only the positron, this is what happens in electron and positrons experiments, they annihilate, poof, they're gone. And that vibration causes two photons to appear. That's it. Those were the pieces of the proton puzzle, and the final one was missing until 2015. So I hope you disregard anything you learned before 2015 about the proton. And I hope that we rethink the proton and what creates all the atomic elements that we know today. Have a good day.